The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for attending our webinar this morning, Pro Properly Classifying Exempt and Non-Exempt Employees in the A&E World. I'm Mary Ann Blau. I'm an HR consultant with Shared HR. Uh, we are on a tight schedule this morning, and we want to be respectful of your time. Because of this, all attendees have been muted. If at any point during the webinar you would like to ask a question, please <coughs> use the questions box on the uh, right side of your screen. We will be taking questions at the end or answering them at the end. If we do not get to your question uh, prior to the end of the webinar, someone will get back to you privately after. Also, when the webinar concludes, when you leave the webinar, you uh, will see a brief survey. We would really appreciate your candid feedback. So our speakers this morning are Paul Finkel, President and Founder of Shared HR, and Eli Gould, a Senior Employment Attorney with MBV Law. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Paul and Eli. Good morning, everyone. This is Paul Finkel. Uh, I'll start with the introduction. I appreciate all of you being here. Uh, this morning, we are going to um, talk to you about properly classifying exempt and non-exempt employees. Um, this is um, a somewhat complicated subject, uh, and we will introduce it uh, and tell you about it as, as clearly as we can uh, with some examples. First, let me introduce myself and then Eli. Uh, Shared HR, our firm, is a consulting, HR consulting and technology firm. And our model shares the best practices and processes from our over 30 years of HR consulting. Cloud computing provides us a way to translate this HR data uh, overload that everybody gets these days into usable actions and update our um, em employers and clients uh, on a multi-state basis. This webinar is part of our continuing series. Uh, Eli and I did one earlier on independent contractors. But this series is an effort to make sense of the employment-related legislative, regulatory, and legal changes that happen. Uh, our goal is to give employers a window into the trends that we see, as well as some direction on how to attract, develop, and retain the best talent while avoiding employment litigation. Uh, as for my background, as Marianne said, I founded Shared HR. Uh, I've also consulted in labor matters for over 30 years. Um, I've worked on numerous staffing models, organization design, job descriptions, role definition, uh, as well as serving in, as an expert witness in employment litigation. Uh, I've also conducted well over 100 HR audits and advised on wage and hour matters. Eli uh, is a member of MBV Law. Uh, MBV Law is a full service law firm with 23 lawyers and two offices in the Bay Area. Uh, it's based in the Bay Area, but the firm practices all over California, uh, and they provide counsel and client representation uh, in most areas of litigation. Uh, the firm has a particularly large representation in the architecture, engineering, and design industry. Uh, Eli Gould is a senior employment attorney with the firm. Uh, Eli provides a full range of legal services on employment and labor issues confronting employers and managers. Examples of his expertise include advice and counsel on all aspects of employment relationships, preventative training on the legal pitfalls confronting employers in California, advice on wage and hour and employee classification issues, counsel on reduction in force assistance uh, and employment issues related to mergers and acquisitions, as well as other corporate transactions. Also it includes representation and union management negotiation relationships, uh, as well as all aspects of employment related litigation. So the way we've, uh, Eli and I decided to uh, address this topic today was with the following agenda. We're going to do a brief introduction. We're going to talk about what's at stake in these kinds of exempt, non-exempt classifications. Then we'll talk about who's properly exempt. Uh, then we'll uh, assess or examine work duties that render exempt or non-exempt. And then we'll talk about some action steps and considerations and answer questions at the end. <coughs> By way of introduction, um, I'd like to make a bit of a disclaimer. 
Uh, first of all, Eli and I did not make these rules and regulations we're about to talk about. Um, and we recognize that they are out of sync with the way lots of people would like to work. Um, and they're out of sync with the uh, limits uh, as well as uh, reasonable accommodations uh, both employees and employers would like to make. Uh, and they kind of impose an antiquated structure on employers. Uh, but um, it seems like in many areas of the law, the law sort of lags behind the way people actually work. And we'll have some examples of that as we go through this. Uh, wage and hour is a very good example of that. It is nevertheless the state of the law right now. So we're going to try and make this as understandable and fun as possible, uh, given the somewhat inherently dry nature of this topic. Um, but it's something that we all need to be aware of because while you may not like some of these regulations, you may not like some of the recommendations we have for compliance, uh, we can guarantee you that you will like that better than litigation which could emanate from this. Right. So that's really our disclaimer before we start today. And with that, let's kind of jump right in. Uh, before you do that, Paul, the thing that I want to or often tell my clients when they kind of chafe against the rules and, and how they apply in their particular workplace is to keep in mind that the wage and hour rules were, were pretty much set in stone back in the 1930s and the 1940s when the paradigm out there was the manufacturing environment. And that's really how these rules were kind of um, devised uh, to deal with a manufacturing environment. Our economy is vastly different than that now, but the rules have, have been very, very slow to evolve and keep up with the change in our economy. It's a very good point. It's a good way of looking at these because you'll you'll find um, that that echoes to be true as we go through this. Um, so perhaps you could jump in, Eli, but basically the, the ground rules are that we've got, we have the Federal Department of Labor, um, which oversees on a federal level, these wage and hour regulations, and then we have uh, essentially a sister organization in California called um, the DLSE, which is the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement here in California. That's and Eli, right. perhaps you could go through these distinctions. Yeah, the uh, at the federal level, the Department of Labor basically is the enforcement mechanism for um, uh, the rules under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And that was the act that was passed back in uh, the 1930s that uh, I alluded to earlier. Uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act um, is very similar to uh, the rules and the uh, statutes in effect in California, but there are some differences. Uh, and that we'll uh, talk about some of those differences in a bit. Um, California has its own set of rules uh, that lay it on top of FLSA, uh, and there are, uh, as I said, some differences between them. There are also some differences in what is substantively required under California's law that is not required under the FLSA. Uh, all that the FLSA really requires is that if someone is not ex exempt from uh, the FLSA, that the employer must pay overtime um, for hours in excess of 40 hours worked in a week. It also has the minimum wage provision, but that's basically what the FLSA does. In California, however, its statute and its rules require overtime um, paid in excess of eight hours a day or in excess of 40 in a week. California rules also require um, a minimum of 30 minutes of a meal break each day and two 10-minute uh, rest breaks if the person is working a full eight-hour or seven-and-a-half-hour day. And the importance of those distinctions are for most California employers, with some very limited exceptions, um, the more stringent rule carries the day, which is usually the California rules um, which are mentioned in the uh, the uh, labor code as well as the wage and uh, wage orders. Yeah, I, which I apply. Tell, sorry, Paul. I tell clients that if you are in compliance with California law, 
99.9% of the time you will be in compliance with federal law. Yes, the problem is California law is quite stringent, yes. uh, which we're going to go into. Yes. So the next piece is that the, uh, the Department of Labor or the California sister agency, the DLSE, uh, really are going to come into your life in two ways. One is going to be an employee complaint. And that is the most frequent way that in our practice we see it, is that uh, somebody doesn't think they've been paid fairly. Um, and whether that's true or not, they go to the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement. Uh, why? Because it's easy and it's free. Um, and the DLSE will investigate those kinds of claims. Um, they also have the power to, to do their own audit. Um, and maybe you can talk just for a moment, Eli, in your practice about how some of these claims start. Yeah, the, the, the two biggest ways that the claims start is someone has got um, the nose out of filter and starts looking at uh, on ways to um, kind of punish their employer. Um, the other is uh, that there's some change that is made in the way that the, the employer is doing business that causes people to wonder, you know, had things been properly uh, handled before? And that actually is one of the things that we're going to deal with a little bit more uh, in talking about if you're out of compliance, how do you get yourself into it? Because one of the, the biggest impediments that I find to people uh, owning up to the fact that we're doing it wrong and we really do make a change is the fear that the employees are going to say, aha, so you've been doing it wrong all along, and they all run off to the DLC. Yes, I think that's true. The other um, issue that we've that I find lots of times is that employees now um, are pretty um, enlightened and aware of their rights under wage and hour. Um, and they tend to go to a website, uh, call the DLSC, check on these things, and sometimes a little bit of information uh, really get, it can be dangerous. Uh, on the flip side, if an employer goes to the DLSC and tries to figure out how to comply, uh, it is a morass that I wouldn't wish on anyone. Uh, so we thought we'd talk about this, and, and this next slide kind of shows um, why we think it's such a big issue. At least according to one source, some, somewhere around 70% of U.S. employers are out of compliance with wage and hour laws somewhere. So this is a pretty prevalent issue out there. Uh, $250 million in wages and penalties have been paid in the 10 largest class action wage and hour cases since 2008. Now this is on the federal level and we're going to go into some detail, uh, Eli will, about what some of the challenges are on the state level, which frankly are even more vexing. Um, the, Department of the Department of Labor's wage and hour enforcement budget was increased by 18 percent this year. Um, and this quote's kind of interesting, and this is from the former administrator of the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division. And he says that case volume goes up when the economy is bad. Employers should be aware that there will always be some percentage of your employees who will talk to a lawyer after separation. Um, at least in my practice, I find that to be quite true. Um, a, that the, the volume seems to be going up, uh, and B, that there is some percentage of employees that always look for outside counsel. Um, the other issue, uh, which we should talk about just briefly, is that um, at, the, at least at the state government, uh, the wage and hour enforcement is considered to be a revenue positive endeavor on the part of the government. In other words, if uh, employers are not doing it right uh, and should be paying penalties, uh, that's something the state believes it should enforce, and it also can, um, depending on the penalties and the like, be a revenue-positive thing. Uh, in this uh, particularly difficult 
economy and environment, uh, there's a renewed effort uh, of enforcement out there on the state level as well. Yeah, so I, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about what's at stake here at the state level. You know. Yeah, there, there are really um, multiple layers of risk involved in this particular area. Uh, one layer of risk is the enforcement by the states and the federal agencies that Paul just alluded to. And there is increasing incentive on the part of both the state and federal agencies to get out there and uh, root out noncompliance and assess penalties because it does generate uh, positive revenue. Uh, the other layer or another layer is uh, the individual actions of the employees in taking um, either individual lawsuits or banding together with some other employees and bringing representative lawsuits or your worst case scenario, the worst nightmare is a class action lawsuit. Uh, that first layer um, with the state and the federal agencies, they're basically got two um, arrows in their quiver, uh, or three, if, uh, depending on how you look at it. One is that they can award unpaid back overtime, just as that could be awarded uh, by a court to an employee. The DLSC can award that to the employee as well. Second arrow in the quiver is the penalties. And the penalty in California is pretty significant uh, because it is for an initial violation, $50 per employee per pay period, and then subsequent, $100 per employee per pay period. And they take the position that the initial violation is the first pay period. So it goes to 100 for the next pay period. Um, they also have the ability to assess penalties for uh, failure to provide a meal period or a rest break. And there was a recent uh, court decision that came out that held that um, if you didn't give someone a meal period and you didn't let them have a rest break within the same day, you get two hours. One hour for the meal break and one hour for the rest break, as opposed to just one hour. And that's even though all you've really done is short the employee 40 minutes because it's a 30-minute meal period and a 10-minute rest break. Uh, but that's the decision. The DLL, DOL can also award overtime. It also has its own penalties and interests, though they're not as significant as the California uh, penalties. Uh, but uh, I think it's not hard to see that you know, the agencies have a real incentive in these bad economic times uh, to not only investigate complaints that come in, to positively get out there and generate revenue. Okay. The, the next and, and more draconian area um, of enforcement uh, of these wage and hour laws uh, is really employees bringing lawsuits uh, as individuals and as class actions. And maybe you can talk about that briefly if you would, Eli. Yeah. Um, seeing a lot of both individual lawsuits and class action lawsuits. And, and the class action ones, you're probably reading a lot about in the papers as well. Um, and there are, there are some doozies out there. Uh, it doesn't take much for an individual to run off and find a lawyer who's willing to take a wage and hour lawsuit these days. And the reason for that is because there's a lot that they can recover. The back overtime for three years, meal and rest period penalties, prejudgment interest, and the real kicker is they're almost always going to be able to recover their attorney's fees if they get something from you. And those fees can be significant. And that's a one-way ratchet. Uh, so if they uh, win, they get their attorney's fees. If they lose, you don't get your attorney's fees. Uh, it's, it's intended to um, um, induce employees to pursue their rights under the wage and hour laws. Uh, a recent development in California is they can also bring a wage and hour violation lawsuit as an unfair trade practice claim. The basic idea being that if you, the employer, are not properly classifying people and not properly paying overtime, then you have an unfair advantage in the marketplace. And that, therefore, the employee can, on the behalf of the marketplace, bring this unfair trade practice claim. The significance of that is that it turns it into a four-year statute of limitations. So 
so they can get an additional year of unpaid overtime or meal and rest period penalties. Uh, another development in California is individuals can bring um, a representative lawsuit under the Private Attorney General Act. And um, basically what that is doing is it's incenting people to go out and police uh, their employer uh, to make sure that they're staying in compliance with the wage and hour rules. The uh, penalties are more limited under the Private Attorney General Act, uh, or the liability, excuse me, is more limited because all you can get under it is restitution of unpaid overtime. And, and that is not the prejudgment interest, the attorney's fees, and all of that. But the individual bringing the lawsuit can collect 25% of the statutory penalties as a reward, if you will, uh, for having brought the Paga suit. Uh, and that has incented a lot of people uh, to rush out and bring uh, Paga suits or add them as a claim to their existing lawsuit. There have been some, uh, a little bit of reining in of the Private Attorney General Act and, and its scope recently, but it's still a pretty uh, effective club uh, to beat employers up with. So to, just to clarify, when, when uh, Eli is using the, agri the acronym PAGA, it means Private Attorney General's Act. Um, so essentially, uh, as a plaintiff employee out there, and by the way, many of these plaintiffs, many of these plaintiffs still stay employed while they bring their claims. Right. So this is not only people who are leaving your organization. This could be people who are still employed by you and still be bringing these um, actions. They have a couple of bites at the apple. Um, they can go to the state uh, administrative route, or they can go uh, with their own private attorney. Uh, so. That's why these cases um, are so troubling. Um, and now to make matters worse, here's a really interesting one. This came across my desk just in the last few days that the Department of Labor has now developed a smartphone app for employees. Um, and what it is is described here. It's a timesheet to help employees independently track the hours they work and determine the wages they are owed. It's available in English and Spanish and users can conveniently track regular work hours, break time, and any overtime hours for one or more employers. Um, so if you work for uh, a couple of different employers, you can track them on this little app. The new technology is significant because instead of relying on uh, their employer's records, workers can now keep their own records. This information could prove invaluable during a wage and hour division investigation where an employer has failed to maintain accurate employment records. That's kind of a biggie because when you actually go to the Department of Labor or the DLSE, um, one of the first things that gets investigated by uh, the administrative staff is, okay, employee bringing the claim, what kind of records do you have? Uh, and I've been in hearings, and Eli, you probably have as well, where you know uh, employees will pull out matchbook covers, old pieces of paper, uh, whatever to kind of show the days and try and prove that they contemporaneously kept records alongside the employer and the employer's uh, time records are somehow non-existent or deficient. Uh, and the problem is that the, they instantly are credited whenever they have such records by the DLSC and then the employer is at the bottom of the hill trying to prove that their time records are better and more accurate. Um, and so this is actually a troubling event because it, as you can see, it would in induce people and encourage people to keep their own records, uh, which may or may not coincide with the employer's record. Yeah, th this is, that's a, a trap for many employers uh, that is very, very uh, troublesome. They view people as exempt who are not properly viewed as exempt. And as a result, they do not keep time records for them because you're not required to keep time records for exempt employees. You are required to keep accurate time records for non-exempt employees. And there are penalties that are assessed for failure to have accurate time records for the non-exempt employees. Uh, that can be assessed uh, by the DLSE uh, as well as 
uh, recovered in a private attorney general lawsuit. Uh, you guys are in a little bit better position because as engineers, architects, and others in the design industry, you are generally keeping track of hours worked because that results in billables. A uh, similar thing happens in the, uh, the legal profession. But you may not track everything uh, that is, is considered work time, um, though I think you're a little bit ahead of the game uh, over some employers. True, and we'll get into some detail in this a little bit later. But that's um, one of the new innovations that the DLLs come up with. <coughs> so let's talk about who's properly exempt. Um, and there are three main exemptions under both federal and state law in this white collar area. So this is the area in which we all live. Um, and basically they're executive, administrative, and professional. And we've got some tools in this presentation which will help you understand those. But Eli, maybe you could start walking through what the common elements are in these. Yeah. The, um, before I, I do that, though, Paul, one of the things that um, I have uh, kind of been surprised to discover, maybe it's because I, I am a lawyer by nature, is that a lot of my clients have trouble coming to terms with the idea that they can't choose who is exempt and who is not exempt and that there are, uh, it really is something that to a large extent is completely out of their control. Not totally, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that you can do with uh, changing a job or changing a job description to help push the person more towards an exempt uh, position. But it, it is uh, a shock sometimes to uh, uh, employers out there that it is something that they, they largely have no control over. Uh, and uh, it just is something that uh, that's the fact of life. Uh, uh, I have to echo that as well in my practice. I mean, peep, it is generally the perception of most employers in most industries, in my experience, that that they believe they get to essentially anoint someone as exempt or um, render them exempt by paying them a salary, and therefore there's no question. And as we'll see going through this, that is just not the case. Yeah. As we go through this, there are a number of elements that go into each exemption. All of those elements must be satisfied in order for an employee to be exempt. If you're missing one of them, then the person is not exempt. All three of the white collar exemptions have three elements in common. Uh, they have to be paid a fixed and recurring salary that is at least $16 per hour if you annualize it. And that's two times California's current minimum wage of $8 per hour. There is also a salary requirement under the federal law, but it is lower than California. So if you meet California's, you'll always be meeting the federal. Uh, the second common element is they have to uh, regularly and customarily exercise discretion and independent judgment in performing their duties. Uh, oftentimes, uh, an individual fails to be exempt because they're not operating at a high enough level of independence, that they really are being told what to do and, and relatively closely supervised uh, so that they get their work done according to the employer's satisfaction. Uh, and the third common element is they have to spend at least 51% of their time actually engaged in exempt duties. There's a little bit of wiggle room in that because work that is directly and closely related to exempt work uh, or a means of carrying out exempt functions gets to count towards that time. This is a big difference from the federal. Uh, and th this is where we part company with the federal pretty significantly. The federal rule is that the exempt duties must be your primary duty. And that is uh, a qualitative thing, not a quantitative uh, assessment. Here in California, we just quantify. Uh, the primary duty test is not something that we follow. So you could have someone who's exempt under the federal who spends only 20% of their time doing exempt duties, but that is so important that it qualifies as their primary duty. That won't apply in California. Another important point 
to underscore this because this is really key to understanding how to get some exempt, non-exempt in California. 51%, I've had many clients say, well, 51% of what? You know, 51% of a year, 51% of a day. Generally, the DLSE in California looks at a month, an average month. And they say during that month, we're 51% of the person's duties really exempt, the work they engaged in. And that is the critical difference. So it's not that uh, you get to knight an employee uh, as exempt or non-exempt simply by giving them a salary. It's during the course of a month, can you look at the mix of work they have? And if, and if those duties are exempt duties, roughly 51% of the time, at least you have an argument position, a pretty good position that the person is exempt. Uh, if it's any less than that, um, you're really in the gray area and maybe uh, most likely, uh, at least initially, the person will end up being non-exempt and therefore eligible for overtime, meal breaks, and so forth. One last point I want to make uh, before I forget on meal breaks. There have been some recent cases that you may have read about in California where there was one, one series of court cases that held that uh, if you don't actually force people who are entitled to meal breaks to take their meal breaks, uh, then the employer can be liable. The good news is that there is a recent California Supreme Court case that says, no, as long as you provide those meal breaks, uh, you don't actually have to enforce people to go take them. Uh, you're in good shape. Paul? So that's just something. Was Brinker decided? Uh, yes, in California, I believe it was. Uh, so that not... It wasn't, called, it wasn't the Brinker case yet, but it was another case that fell right in with Brinker. I so, think that, but that's at the Court of Appeals level. The, the California Supreme Court has been holding a case called Brinker for almost two years now that, that held that uh, you only have to provide work uh, meal and rest breaks. You don't have to require that people take them. But uh, the uh, Labor and Employment Bar has been waiting breathlessly for almost two years uh, to hear what the California Supreme Court has to say, and that, that hasn't even been briefed yet in the last report. Okay, then I stand corrected on that. But the, I think the prevailing, well, there's a, there's a large hope that that logic will prevail in that case because it's so impractical to try to force people to actually take their breaks. Uh, yeah, in there are so many industries. Three, uh, courts, that, three courts of appeal, Paul, uh, have ruled that that should be the rule. So um, it's definitely uh, the lower courts uh, view it as very simple that you know you you shouldn't be required to run around three times a day and say get out. Yeah. So I just wanted to bring that up because I know people may have read about that uh, particular issue. So let's go into who's exempt particularly professional. Yeah, the, um, we said there are three types of uh, exemptions that would apply. Uh, we don't cover the executive uh, very extensively here, but basically that is someone who is supervising two or more people uh, and um, uh, is really kind of setting the policy and the management direction of the company doesn't have to be the CEO only. Uh, it can come down several layers below that. But um, they have to be involved in really um, supervising and managing the business before they'll be considered executive. And in most architecture and engineering firms, there will be a layer of people who meet that exemption. Um, the, that layer often also meets the professional exemption which is just something that is uh, idiosyncratic about your profession, but in any event. Uh, the second exemption is the uh, ad administrative. And uh, we, we can talk about that a little bit more, uh, but maybe we should come back to that, because um, the administrative exemption is not going to cover that many people within an architecture firm or an engineering firm. Um, the uh, as I said, the paradigm for uh, the economy and employment 
when these rules were devised was the manufacturing environment. You have the, uh, the uh, factory room floor and everybody down on the factory room floor who were uh, kicking out the widgets that were sold that were the reason for the uh, existence of the company were non-exempt. And everybody who sat in the offices up above that floor and uh, either ran the thing or uh, made sure that the internal operations of the factory were running, were exempt. They're either executive or administrative. Uh, and that paradigm is often used uh, by the courts in looking at, you know, is someone exempt under the administrative exemption? Uh, that kind of is different from how they look at it under uh, the executive or the professional exemption. The most important one for your industry uh, is obviously the professional exemption. And there are three prongs to this exemption. Uh, some people would argue that there are four, and I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but I, I, I think that's a separate exemption. The first prong is licensed or certified professional. If you've got someone who is licensed in architecture or licensed in engineering uh, and they are doing the other three things that uh, we mentioned, which they almost always are if they're licensed, then they're going to be exempt. Easy. Uh, and that, that accounts for a large number of uh, your employees. Some of you who are in the design industry, uh, for example, interior designers, uh, won't be able to take advantage of the licensure prong because the state doesn't provide for licensure for uh, uh, your professionals. Um, second prong is the artistic professional. Forget that one. That is your opera singers and your painters and your uh, sculptors uh, for hire. Uh, it's, it's limited to those in the fine arts. Third prong is the learned professional. And that's an important one, but it is also the grayest one out there. Uh, and it gives the most trouble uh, to people. Um, the learned profession prong is met if the person's exempt duties require knowledge of an advanced type in a field of science and learning, customarily acquired by a prolonged course of specialized intellectual instruction and study, as opposed as distinguished from a general academic education and from an apprenticeship. Um, the, the balance of it is not quite as essential. Um, the keys in there, uh, and I think we've got that on the next slide, Paul. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Advanced knowledge in a field of science or learning, customarily acquired by a prolonged course of, course of specialized instruction and study, and not a general academic education. For your people who you consider professional, but who are not licensed, the only way you're going to get them in as an exempt employee is here. Uh, if they don't have administrative functions, they're part of your professional staff, but they're not licensed, this is where all the action occurs. Just looking ahead here, Paul. So I'm let's see, I'm trying to. There we go. Uh, this document is a summary, which is a little difficult to read on this screen. And if anyone would like one uh, in PDF, we'd be happy to email it to you later. But this is kind of a, a way of looking at the different exemptions that are available in California. And we've touched on all these. The executive uh, is pretty easy to understand. The administrative uh, exemption is one that Eli's been talking about. And that one is a little bit trickier. Professional is pretty straightforward with the exception that we just touched upon. There could be some of you that have the computer exemption, uh, but this would be people who are doing CAD work or just almost all their work online and on the system. Um, and outside sales. Paul, let, let me interrupt there because um, on the computer exemption, your CAD people are not going to qualify under that. They are expressly excluded uh, from the computer professional 
Exactly. The, oh, because they're not designing the software. Yeah, the little background on the computer exemption, and I think it casts some good light on uh, what we're going to talk about with the learned professional exemption. The computer exemption in California is the most recent one. It was enacted in 2000. And the reason why it was enacted is because Silicon Valley woke up to the realization that all of those software engineers with ponytails and laptops working 18 hours a day did not fall under any other exemption, including the learned profession exemption. And you would think that, that uh, a highly trained software engineer would be the logical one to fall under the learned profession, but they were not very successful. Um, so uh, they lobbied the state legislature and created this computer professional exemption. And it is focused on people who do software programming and systems analysis. And that's really the, the group that it was designed to bring under the exemption. Okay, well thank you for that clarification because that does impact this industry. Um, and, but I would imagine few people out there employ people that are actually doing enough programming uh, and system design to fall under this. Yeah, I, uh, if you're not part of Silicon Valley, then it's it's difficult to bring them under. Because I feel yeah, I found it pretty rare in my client group. Um, so let's take a look now at the duties because this is where the rubber meets the road. As we were saying earlier, it's not that you get to anoint them. It's that how do, does the DLSE and the Department of Labor really look at these duties? Um, and let's get into them. Um, you know, these are some of the common problems that, that both of us have found in our practices. Uh, that particularly smaller terms, firms treat everyone as exempt. Um, it would seem logical, uh, if you hadn't been, heard the first part of this presentation, that they ought to be. Uh, but in a small firm, if you've got six to 12 people, uh, to, to think that everyone is exempt, um, uh, I've rarely seen it in my practice. I, I, I echo that, Paul, and uh, it surprises me sometimes, uh, you know, the receptionist, for example, is exempt. And there really is almost no way that that person could be. Exactly. Um, so, simply because they've been paid a fixed salary, um, doesn't mean that they're exempt. Um, however, um, you can render somebody who would otherwise be exempt uh, sometimes by paying them hourly um, because it clouds the water. Um, so you have to be careful and, calm and uh, logical about how you're handling this. Um, the most vexing area, however, um, that I think we could should deal with in the time we have today is really about junior professionals um, or those who are not clearly licensed. Um, and those are things that we should, uh, Eli, you might want to talk about that a little bit and, and I will as well. Yeah, that, that is probably the most common problem that I have experienced with architecture firms and engineering firms is uh, people who are one and two years out of school, uh, not yet eligible for licensure, but who uh, expect to be treated as quote unquote on professionals and the employer wants to treat them as professionals. Uh, they pay them a salary, they uh, treat them in all other respects as if they are a professional, but they really uh, have a hard time falling within any exemption. Uh, this is where you know, the learned professional uh, exemption might offer uh, some safe haven, uh, particularly for those unlicensed people who have been working for quite some time, who are out there actually being leads on projects, uh, or um, the principal architect, principal engineer, they just elected not to be licensed. And then there are a number of people out there like that who've been working for a long time, uh, or who have uh, something other than a BS in architecture or a BS in engineering. Uh, and uh, really do have an advanced degree. 
Uh, the rule of thumb that, that I have adopted for my clients is if they're not eligible for licensure and all they have is a BS or a BA, you are not going to be able to bring them under the learned profession exemption. Uh, if they have advanced degrees, if they are kind of, uh, have been working longer, are eligible for licensure, your argument gets better. Uh, one of the things that I advise my clients is you really do want to, um, for the people who are eligible, you really do want to incent them to sit for licensure and be licensed so that, you know, remove any semblance of doubt that they are exempt employees. Yes, and another point, which is why we added it here, is that um, if you have people in that category, we would highly recommend that you begin thinking about how you're going to do record keeping and time tracking. Uh, because if they're in that gray area, um, you, you need to find out if you've got exposure. And for the reasons we pointed out earlier, you're going to need to have some kind of record keeping in the event you were ever challenged as to what their hours were. Uh, otherwise, I've been involved in cases where uh, people have been known to exaggerate the number of hours that they worked or the meal periods they didn't take. And without, no. <laughs> it's possible, yes. And without um, good records, it's very hard to track. Because you could see, they could be using their iPhone app and putting in whatever they want, uh, and you're going to have to have something to refute that. Um, this is where we talked a little bit more about uh, your rule of thumb. You know, the, um, the other point that I would like to make uh, on this slide is that um, I know uh, a couple of my clients in the uh, architecture and engineering industry um, have had uh, very rough times in this economy. Uh, and they have downsized significantly. And a number of cases, uh, individuals who used to work for them have come back uh, on an internship, um, and some of them even unpaid internships. Um, and I thought I would make a note that um, you, you, you aren't necessarily dodging even the exempt, non-exempt issue if you're not paying people. Uh, and if interns are doing anything of value or benefit to an employer, um, then they are required to be paid, uh, and depending on what they're doing, they may, may well be entitled to overtime. Uh, so I just thought I would put that out there because that's come up in my practice. Yeah, I the, want to echo that. Uh, they sometimes called interns, sometimes they call them uh, other things. Uh, but they're, they're basically trying to get uh, uh, free labor. Uh, from the individuals. And the individuals are, are often willing to provide that free labor uh, because it, it does uh, benefit their career, it benefits their training, you know, and they're hoping to ride out uh, the bad time. The, uh, I, the rule of thumb that you have to apply, though, is if you are accepting the services of anyone that um, uh, benefits you, and in fact, um, in order to be an intern, the rule often is it has to be a detriment to you, not a benefit to you, before that person will be found to be an intern. Because unpaid internships are allowed only to assist people in learning a profession or learning a trade. And that needs to be an impediment to you, not uh, somebody cheaper than you would otherwise have to employ. Good. Now perhaps um, we should talk for a moment about what sort of considerations and action steps uh, you might take. Um, one of the, uh, before we start into this, uh, an audit would be very useful for the reasons we've talked about. Um, this is a gray area as you can tell. Uh, there are argument positions uh, that we've tried to outline that you may have for some individuals in the gray area. So what I tell clients in terms of looking at an audit, uh, take a look at your entire workforce uh, and basically separate out the ones who are clearly exempt, uh, those people who are the executives, those people who are licensed. Um, 
Those are the easy ones to separate out and then take a look at those people in the gray area and that's where you want to spend your time uh, and your thought process in your audit on what exactly are they doing and have those duties changed. That is a big issue for a lot of my clients, particularly in this industry. Uh, when times were good and things were busy, uh, duties were different and now there's job sharing. There's much more on every individual's plate uh, in the tighter economy. What really is that job mix? You know, can that job mix be justified as exempt now? Uh, those are some important questions you need to ask yourself. Um, and we suggest that you look at all jobs and all positions because um, there are going to be those gray ones and maybe we've uh, been able to uh, heighten your antenna a little bit today on what really is gray that you might have not have thought was gray before we, with this webinar. Um, and we highly encourage you to err on the side of caution uh, in terms of whether they are. And if that's true, uh, make sure that you are keeping accurate records on all those gray area folks. Um, Next, we, are, we want to talk to you a little bit about bringing in some outside expertise. Um, it, it is very common to um, lose perspective while inside an organization. Uh, and sometimes it's very helpful to have an outside look say, well, now how exactly are you justifying that your receptionist is exempt? Uh, because I'm a little curious about that. Um, you know, the example that Eli's used earlier uh, is a common one in my practice. Uh, I, I've, um, many organizations have tried to convince me that their receptionist uh, is exempt. Uh, and uh, it's not flown yet. Um, so really you should take, uh, have an outside look come in. Um, and the next piece that I have, and you may want to jump in on this as well, Eli, is take a look at your remote workers as well. Um, lots of organizations have gone to virtual organizations in this tight economy uh, and they've lost office space. Uh, I've got a couple of clients that used to have a fairly good sized office and now the principals are working out of the home uh, and many of the people that they employ work remotely. So what are your policies on that? How do you track time on that? How do you know when they're really working? How do you know what those duties are? Um, you have to have some policies about that. Um, because that is a reality of how people are working these days. Um, and another point I've found that's very helpful is you should try to automate some of your work processes to mitigate your risk. Um, by that I mean do you have an automated time tracking system? As Eli pointed out, many do in this industry because uh, you're, you're billing hours uh, and you're tracking time against project work. Uh, so maybe you've got a system, but are you really tracking that for these wage and hour purposes we've talked about here? And do you have policies in place that ask people to uh, indicate when they're out on a rest break or a meal period? Um, or is it just the billable hours? Because if it's only the latter, then I would argue your timekeeping systems are probably inadequate to defend a wage and hour case. Uh, and that's kind of the perspective. When we say an audit or having some outside person look in, that's the perspective that we're talking about. Um, is, are your policies defensible? Do you have a reasonable um, wage an hour and a time tracking system that would stand up uh, to the employee's phone app or their handwritten notes? Uh, those are the kinds of questions. And then really what are the duties and what percentage of those duties are being performed by the individual? Those are the, the tough questions that have to get asked in order to be able to defend yourself. Uh, Eli, do you have any other thoughts on this page? Not on this page. I have a couple on, on the next one. Okay. Um, the best piece of advice I think you can carry away from today is if you find that you are not in compliance, make the changes. Uh, as I said, one of the biggest impediments to doing it 
is saying, all right, that's going to alert people that we haven't been doing it right up to now. And that they're all going to run off and they're all going to file claims and we're going to be really uh, in deep doo-doo. Um, what making the changes does is it puts a stake in the ground on the statute of limitations. If you don't make the changes, that three, possibly four year period of time is constantly with you. It, it just follows you. If you make the change, the clock starts ticking down on the statute of limitations. Um, the other thing that, um, in conjunction with making those changes, is you buy some message. How are you going to package this to explain why you're making changes? And I will, I will give you one concrete example of an architecture firm that I dealt with who uh, moved their uh, unlicensed junior architects into non-exempt. They put together a package where they created an incentive and a bonus program for people when they became eligible to sit for licensure, to go off to study, to sit for the licensure, and to receive a bonus when they got the license. And they, they put the message together that we value the license as part of your career, as part of our professional presentation in the marketplace. So we want to push everyone that we can towards licensure. The junior people who aren't eligible for licensure, we're going to uh, allow you to make extra money um, by uh, letting you get overtime. And they really did message it very well. Not a ripple. I mean, they, it's been several years now and there's not been any uh, anguish uh, on the part of um, their employees. They, they've accepted the change. That won't necessarily work for everybody, but the, the point being, they sat down and they put together a message that was something other than, oops, we've been doing it wrong. Uh, and we were able to successfully put that stake in the ground and make the change. That's uh, a good example. That's a very good example because we've, we've seen that happen in our practice as well. You, you need some other event, whether it's the introduction of a new software or an HR system or something um, that you can positively point to that's a, that's a positive change for everyone. Uh, you, you don't want to leave it simply that you change people so that everyone focuses on that event. Um, last two bullet points there, and then I think we need to go to questions because we're running a little behind, is um, take a look at the size of your problem. If you determine you've got a problem, um, estimate or calculate, if you can, exactly, how big a problem it is, and consider paying it. Doesn't eliminate all risk. There's still the possibility of penalties being assessed against you. But in the um, 25 years that I've been practicing, when I w worked with a client that has gone to the people and said, oops, we did it uh, inadvertently wrong, here is the overtime. And that has been, uh, oh, seven or eight times over that period of time. Uh, Nobody has filed a lawsuit, or nobody's rushed off to the DLSC. Um, that's one possible uh, way to do it. And the final bullet point is, uh, if you've got borderline cases, gray cases that you think you can defend, keep in mind that jobs change over time. So audit those positions on a regular basis to make sure you still got the, the proper classification. And one thing that is very helpful is making sure that the job description for the person that shows that they are exempt actually tracks what the person does. So if you got an obsolete job description, bring it up to date. Yeah, that's good advice. And why don't we uh, now go to questions. I'm afraid we don't have much time, Marianne, but do you have uh, one or two burning ones? Yeah, there are a number of questions uh, regarding the licensure and the profession, the learned professional exemption, um, particularly if you are, if you have received your uh, certification from an independent certification organization, would that count? Or um, lead certification? A lot of questions about what what licenses apply. Yeah, yeah. The uh, language in the statute talks about licensure and certification and the reason they talk about certification is because 
for teachers, there is not licensure, or there was not licensure. So they have to be, uh, for example, engineering, because that can result in licensure by the state, that has to be, uh, the state licensure has to be in place to be exempt under that prong of the professional. For the learned profession, um, licensure and certification is really a non-issue. It's not if you are certified, it's what was your academic training? And, and what was the, the training that uh, in? Was it scientific and technical? Was it advanced? Was it non-general academic uh, education? And are you applying the skills learned, the knowledge learned, in your duties? So you could have someone who has the advanced degree, but they're working uh, in an area that is not related to their degree uh, and is not scientific and technical, and they wouldn't qualify under the learning profession because they're not performing the, the requisite exempt duties. All right. A um, couple other questions on that same topic. If you're actively taking the architectural licensure exam, or if you're eligible for licensure, uh, does that affect whether you can be made exempt? I have, um, and not to cut you off, Paul, but I, I have taken the position, if you've got someone who is eligible for licensure, uh, and they are working independently enough, they're out there, um, not just uh, the lowest rung on the totem pole of a project team, uh, and you can make some argument about their academic background, that it is more than just a BA, for example, then I think you've got a very good argument that they fall under the learned professional exemption. My comfort level increases the longer that person uh, has been out of school and the more responsible uh, their position uh, within the project is. And I was surprised to learn how many people have been out practicing 25, 30 years who decided not to sit for licensure, but they are definitely the lead person on a project. And I think that person is clearly going to be uh, exempt. All right. Yeah. I, agree. Uh, well, I think we're a little short on time. Mm -hmm. um, so Marianne, perhaps um, are there any other, we, we will get back to people who uh, were uh, interested enough to submit questions uh, individually. Uh, and we will provide copies of the uh, PowerPoint as well as the um, uh, summary documents if anyone would like them. Um, There's a question in the during... survey when you leave. Uh, that, so if you just say yes to the question in the survey when the webinar concludes, we will email you the presentation as well as that matrix document. Great. Well, with that, why don't we thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope you got something out of it, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at one of our webinars in the future. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for participating. Thank you, Eli. Thanks, guys. Bye.